Order. We must now move to questions to the Minister for Social Development. As questions number 2, 5, 9 and 10 have been withdrawn, I call Mr Raymond McCartney. Question number one, quick. Cast over a hand at home. Uh, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, the final report of the Housing Repossession Task Force was published on the 12th of February and outlines a range of recommendations on how existing systems of support can be improved and how people in difficulty can be encouraged to come forward uh, to help for help earlier. This is uh, an incredibly important area of work and I'm currently considering how the task force recommendations can be used to make a positive impact for many households affected by this very serious issue. And I plan to publish a formal response to the report uh, shortly, but there are a number of proactive recommendations that I am keen to support. These include uh, continued funding of support for mortgage interest, which assists homeowners on certain benefits, with mortgage interest payments allowing them to remain in their homes. Timely assistance from the Northern Ireland Housing Executive, including uh, homelessness assessment for vulnerable households, and increasing the availability of voluntary exit schemes, such as assisted voluntary sales. Across the United Kingdom, there are signs that the situation is improving, with the number of mortgage approvals increasing and the number of mortgages in arrears decreasing. The task force recommendation aim to improve the situation in Northern Ireland further and help uh, gather the numbers of households that engage proactively with their lenders uh, at an earlier stage. <coughs> McCartney for supplementary. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for that answer and indeed for the information which he has, has supplied. I know he's put in a number of, of, of issues and dealt with a number of issues, but I'm just wondering, is there a contingency if there is a, a spike or an, in, or an increase in the interest rate, will, will the plan be rigorous enough to offset that as well? I uh, thank the member for his, his supplementary. Obviously, given the nature of this particular issue, it is something that I think that we can't just allow to be uh, set in a, a number of recommendations in a document that has not the flexibility to be able to respond to what may be the changing circumstances as a result of an issue, as he mentions, in regards to interest rise. Uh, so certainly that is something that I think we need to keep under review. And what I will uh, assure the member is that that particular issue in regards to how we would respond will be given consideration so that we are left as flexible as we possibly can. No one should underestimate, I think, the seriousness of the situation for those families that are affected by this particular matter, and it's something that I believe has been highlighted by the task force, and it's something that we need to keep constantly under review so that we have every eventuality covered to be as proactive as we possibly can, given the challenges that we face. Ms. Paula Bradley. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers uh, so far, and I also thank the member for tabling this question. Uh, recently in DSD, we had a briefing from the task force, and they highlighted, as you have highlighted, that um, early intervention uh, is one of the key priorities that we need to be addressed. Can I ask the Minister what, it, what is your department doing um, to encourage home homeowners in distress to seek advice early? Uh, thank the, the member for her supplementary. And, and obviously, this is an issue, as it is in most of these cases, where uh, relevant, appropriate information at the right time is something which could uh, be of great benefit and great help. Currently, my department is working with the Behavioural Insights team, uh, actually known as the, the Nudge Unit, so uh, I think it, maybe it's appropriately called, to examine how behavioural economics can provide an innovative stimulus. Uh, to uh, borrow uh, engagement. My department will soon implement the recommendations uh, as we have discussed in the original question of the Housing Repossessions Task Force, which includes the establishment uh, of one of the recommendations in regards to a mortgage options hub for the delivery of specialist mortgage debt advice at an early stage and the harmonisation of debt advice services. And I think of that 
uh, is implemented, it will encourage people uh, to come forward a lot earlier in the process, a lot earlier when the indications are pointing to a serious situation. And I trust as a result of that, we could and I think should uh, avert some of the more uh, disastrous outcomes that come about as a result of the repossession of one's home. Well, Ms. Sander, over end. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Minister outline why he has not brought in a mortgage relief scheme, such as the Mortgage to Shared Equity scheme that is currently in place in Scotland? Well, I think that uh, if you look at what has happened in other jurisdictions, it's always, I think we always need to ensure that uh, we have put in place the right appropriate mechanisms which deals with the issues in, in Northern Ireland. If you look at uh, the Mortgage Rescue Scheme, uh, and we could be asked why are we not implementing that immediately. Mortgage rescue is a, a complex policy with a range of stakeholders that are needed to deliver a successful scheme. The key lesson from the English experience uh, is that to achieve value for money, the policy development phase cannot be rushed. To ensure we secure buy-in from all the key sectors, the scheme, if viable, will deliver value for money if uh, we have asked the Northern Ireland Federation of Housing Associations to complete a feasibility study. So I think that there is, I, I never take the view that there's nothing that we can learn from other schemes, uh, but I always take the view in terms of how we can ensure that the schemes which we introduce in Northern Ireland are bespoke to the specific needs that actually address the problems in Northern Ireland. And I think that's one of the reasons as to why we will not rule anything out but we'll be cautious as to what it is we implement over the next number of years. Mr. Patsy McLaughlin. Colonel Maggot, for your last count, Coyle. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I guess we have to I uh, thank the, the Minister too. Uh, will the Minister accept that, and I heard him referring earlier to the fact that some support may be introduced for people who are on benefits um, with, with their payments. Um, but will the Minister also accept that, yes, there is the intervening gap from somebody going on to benefits until they get actual mortgage interest paid, but will he also accept the issue of the lace curtain poor, those people who aren't on benefits but are on very low income and therefore fall into the debt trap and the consequentials for them in payments of their mortgages? Member does raise uh, a valid point in relation to this, and, and if you look at particularly those households uh, that uh, there's a, an issue in regards to negative equity, uh, the, the lenders are acknowledging that house price inflation alone will not alleviate the drag of negative equity on, on the market mobility, and consequently we can increasingly expect products for customers in equi negative equity such as the mortgaging reporting to become available. And that, I think, is also pointing to the fact the responsibility that's on uh, the uh, banks, the, the responsibility that's on the, the lenders to ensure that the products that they uh, provide are not only for those who are in receipt of benefits, but also for those uh, families who are working families who have pressures, who have problems and who do struggle uh, in many of these circumstances and sometimes can find it difficult to find a friend uh, who can, in, in the system, be of help or assistance to them. Question number three. Mr Chris Hazard is not in this place. I call Mr Martino Mulmer. Uh, Kestakar, uh, question four. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Uh, the Lanyon Tunnels has been identified as a regeneration project uh, that has the potential to provide commercial and regeneration activity in the markets area of Belfast. Working in conjunction with the private sector led regeneration of the Stuart Street lands, the project also offers the community of the markets area the benefit of greater connectivity to the city centre. An application for the Social Investment Fund has been made to OFMD FM, and this is currently being assessed. Belfast City Council carried out a contamination study on the site in November 2014, and the findings are currently being analysed. The South Belfast Social Enterprise Hub contract was awarded in May 2014 to the Consortium of Belfast South Community Resource. Uh, CM Marketing and Community Training Research Services, and a hub manager and a team of associates 
provide support such as mentoring, training and ideas generation to new social enterprise and to existing social enterprise who want to develop new business ideas. The Hub also provides free facilities to undertake hot desking and te test trading to new social enterprises. The retail unit available for the test trading as part of the Hub at 86 Sandy Row opened on a test trading basis on the 3rd of November with Made in Belfast with Love, a social enterprise craft collective being the first to occupy the space. To November 30, 2014, 131 individuals and groups have engaged with the South Belfast Hub on Sandy Row to consider options around starting up new social enterprises in that area. This activity will bring significant value to the area in terms of skills development, community group development and potential new business starts with associated job creation. Well, Mr. Mueller for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and, and thanks also to the Minister. Comprehensive answer, uh, Minister. All, all, obviously, not all in your bailiwick, but I do appreciate the work you have done for both projects. Could I ask, as they, as they reach the finish line on both projects, and they are uh, and very close now to getting full grant aid, would you pledge your continued support uh, for both projects, Sandy Row, and I visited the test project? Uh, in Sandy Row and to the Lanyon Tunnels in the market. Would you pledge your support as they uh, finish this, this journey towards full funding? Uh, I thank the, the member for a supplementary. And obviously, when you look at the work that has been done to date, and this is always the challenge that I think we face in regards to many of these particular projects, when you get something up and running, when you get uh, an end goal uh, in sight, uh, it would be very disappointing for all those involved if we weren't able to see it actually brought in to fruition. I did mention, and it is something that we need to be uh, cognizant of, and that is in relation to the contamination uh, survey that has been carried out. And I want to ensure that uh, as, as those uh, elements of information are brought to the fore, that they don't become a reason for not reaching the finishing line and seeing a project brought in to reality, which I do believe uh, could have huge significance, uh, as I outlined in my original answer, to linking another part of, of the city with the city centre and giving a community uh, and communities sometimes the opportunity that feel as though uh, because of the road layout, because of the location, that they are disconnected from the rest of the city, which could, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. But when you have on site a project like this, then I think that can dispel that, and I certainly will give uh, the assurance that I will continue to do, and my department will do what we can to see this brought over the line. Call Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answer so far and thank him for his uh, interest in the South Belfast area and his recent visit uh, to the Sandy Row area. But can I ask the Minister uh, what assessment uh, he has to date of the success of the enterprise hubs uh, in the all areas? Uh, I thank uh, the member and I thank him for the work that he continues to do uh, in representing the area in South Belfast and the issues that he has already brought to my attention. Uh, obviously, the issue of the, the social enterprise hubs uh, is one that's not just specific in terms of, of South Belfast. It, it covers uh, a wide area of locations. And I think it would be right to say that it's almost too early at this stage to state whether or not the pilot phase has been successful. However, early indications continue to be positive. The initial task of securing and fitting out premises for the hubs has been completed in all areas, and stakeholder and client feedback on the quality of the facilities has been universally positive. The enterprise activity is now ramping up across the hubs, and I am optimistic that we will see an increase in social enterprise startups and the associated economic, uh, economic benefits as a result of this pilot phase. And I think that when we look at other locations, I think that what uh, we can say about the, this particular uh, approach is that it has been the catalyst for others. And I made reference to one particular business uh, that has now started up as a result of the South Belfast 
uh, hub. And I think that it's when we see more of that taking place that we generate within the community and within the wider area that entrepreneurial spirit and a determination to ensure that economic regeneration is in the hands of the community as well as in the hands of larger organisations. Mr. Fargo McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? Uh, can I ask him how these generation proposals can take account of best practice uh, in building a shared future, and is that one of the defined objectives? Well, I think, uh, and I thank the member for his, uh, his answer. I think that uh, all that we do in this assembly should be about trying to ensure that we continue to recognise that while we have still many differences as a society, there are many things that we do that we can do in a way which is uh, to the benefit of all communities and, and shared. I think that we, we run the risk always in, in Northern Ireland of believing somehow that it is only about two communities, that somehow uh, shared uh, is only about two communities. Northern Ireland is becoming a, a very diverse uh, country with many varying interests and many varying uh, elements of community right across the country. And we need to ensure that whatever it is we do in regards to uh, this project or, or any other project, that we take into consideration the community and communities that we are working with and in and recognise that there are sometimes will be sensitivities that we have to recognise, but that should not deflect us away from the overall objective of the scheme, which is to enhance, enhance communities generally. And by doing that, I believe we all benefit. Call Mr Dominic Bradley. <laughs> Question number six. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, and thank uh, the member for for his, his question. Uh, the, with the Speaker's permission, I will also answer questions 6 and 11 together, as both are uh, in reference to the Affordable Warmth Scheme. Uh, following two successful pilots in 2012 and 2013, my, inter, my department introduced a new Affordable Warmth Scheme on the 14th of September 2014. The Warm Home Scheme will end on the 31st of March 2015, and from the 1st of April will be replaced by the Affordable Warm Scheme as the Department's primary tool to address fuel poverty. This scheme is a new area-based approach which will find and assist those households in severe or extreme fuel poverty using a targeting tool that has been developed by the Ulster uh, uh, University and successfully tested in the pilots. It differs significantly from the Warm Home Scheme targeting specific low-income households likely to be subject to fuel poverty. There are over 33,000 households in Northern Ireland in severe uh, or extreme fuel poverty. That is, they need to spend more than a quarter of their household income on energy costs. These are the households which the Affordable Warm Scheme will find and help as a priority. All of the energy efficiency measures available under the Warm Home Scheme will be retained under the Affordable Warm Scheme, with some additional new measures added. The scheme is administered in partnership with local councils and the Housing Executive and gives households control, uh, householders control over their choice of installer and when they get the work carried out. All local councils across Northern Ireland are targeting households identified as most at risk of fuel poverty. Those areas identified most in need of energy efficiency measures will be contract contacted first. To qualify for the scheme, the householder's gross annual household income must be less than £20,000, and householders will be free to choose a provider to install the approved measures, and all work completed will be subject to the inspection by building control officers. Mr. Donald Broadley for a supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I take this opportunity to apologise to you for being absent during the previous question time when you called me? Um, can I ask the Minister how the scheme will be monitored and reviewed? Well, I think that uh, what we will do, there will be an ongoing process of, of monitoring and evaluation. And obviously, when uh, we would come to the end of the scheme, uh, as has been the case with the previous scheme, there will be an evaluation. But I can assure the member that even over recent days, 
what we have been endeavouring to do is we have heard some, some representations have been made to us uh, by uh, your colleague, uh, Mrs Kelly, uh, in relation to the practical outworkings of the scheme. And I had a meeting just last week also with a, a charitable, charitable organisation who expressed some concerns about how this was being rolled out. And what we will do is we will ensure that those issues, in fact, what we have done since that meeting is we have reinforced with local councils uh, the importance of making sure that uh, people are aware of the scheme, that people uh, are fully aware of the criteria that is used in terms of access to the scheme. And I would take the view that the evaluation is ongoing in relation to this matter because this is, again, an issue that is very relevant, very pertinent to many homes of those 33,000 households in Northern Ireland who want to have a better outcome when it comes to the issue of addressing fuel poverty. I call Mr Morris Devaney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, and I, can I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Can I ask the Minister, can households self-refer into the affordable warm scheme like in the old warm home scheme? Uh, I thank my colleague uh, for, for the, the question. The, the affordable warm scheme is primarily a targeted scheme, and, and I expect that the vast majority of homes assisted will be in the target group which came about as a result of the uh, scheme or the, the process that was used to identify the homes through uh, the University of, uh, of uh, Ulster's uh, process. I think it was called uh, an algorithm. And, uh, that was more difficult for me to say. Don't ask me to spell it. I'm sure you really will have difficulties then. However, I do accept that there will be householders who meet the criteria for the scheme but are not in the area being particularly by the Council. Councils have the discretion to accept non-targeted referrals from a range of sources, including health professionals, social workers and environmental health officers. Well, Mr Roy Beggs. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. It will take some time for the new affordable warrant scheme to get up and running and work to actually get out on the ground. And the Minister has mentioned that this is replacing the warm home scheme. Can the Minister uh, assure me that all those who will have applied under the warm home scheme before the deadline date uh, will, uh, despite there being perhaps a late surge, will uh, receive payment for any work that has been carried out? Yes, I uh, am confident that we will be able to get the process of the first scheme uh, brought to an end uh, and that we will have a situation whereby when one comes to an end, the other will be in place. I will give the, the member assurance that, that that is an issue. Obviously, you face the challenge when you're moving from one particular scheme to another that all the elements of it, the funding elements and, and the referral elements and all of that are brought to an end in a timely and efficient way, and I'll give the member the assurance that that issue uh, is a matter which is of uh, importance to us within the department, so that one comes to an end, all is down and dusted before uh, we move on to the new scheme. Call Mr. Tom Elliott. Uh, question number seven, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and thank the, the member for, for the question. The Regeneration Bill is the mechanism to allow conferral of powers and functions uh, from my department uh, to councils. I introduced the Regeneration Bill to the Assembly on the 8th of December of 2014. Second stage debate took place on the 20th of January 2015 uh, and was passed over uh, to the Social Development Committee for detailed scrutiny. Although the powers will not be conferred until 2016, my officials and I are working closely with councils to ensure that my department's regeneration and community development activities fit with locally development plans in the intervening period. In the incoming months, I will be meeting representatives of each of the new councils to discuss a range of issues and to ensure a smooth transfer of powers to the new council from April 2016. And indeed, I commence uh, that process uh, after question time today, when I will meet the first of the councils uh, to discuss this particular issue. Mr. Elliott, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that uh, update uh, on progress. 
just wondering if the Minister and his department have yet refined how much money will, will follow from his department to local government for those devolved functions, particularly in neighbourhood renewal? Uh, I thank the, the member for uh, his supplementary. And uh, it's interesting to note whenever you have a budget and when you ever, whenever you are distributing that, everybody all of a sudden realises that there's an importance in making sure that uh, you get your question either in if you're a member or you get your piece on Good Morning Ulster or some other programme so that uh, I have heard all the concerns. And obviously, uh, I am still in the process, and I would have preferred, I have to say, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, to be in a better position uh, in terms of time on this issue than where I'm currently at. I've met with officials over the last uh, 10 days. Uh, we have had discussions in relation to uh, the budget, and I have now asked for some uh, refinement and some further information to ensure that within the challenges that I face as far as uh, the budget is concerned, that we do not have uh, a situation where it is perceived by the councils that somehow we are reducing their budget uh, just because it is easy to do. But I want to work with the councils. Uh, yes, it won't be the same envelope uh, as I think that we had originally envisaged that will transfer in terms of the amount of money. But I am doing everything that I possibly can to minimise that in a practical way and indeed where I can, if possible, introduce uh, some other way whereby councils would have access to some other element of funding. And we're currently uh, having discussions with my officials as to how that would be done, what it would look like, and how actually we could practically deliver it uh, for councils, so that when it comes to uh, the transfer date in April of 16, that councils are in possession, not only of the finance, but of the, the, the policy and the process that gives them some sense of continuity uh, and I don't want to be in a position where I am imposing uh, my will on the local authorities. I think that would not be what the role or the vision of the transfer of powers and fun functions were. And I want to continue to work with the councils to minimise what will be a challenging uh, outcome in relation to my budget. I remind the Minister of the two-minute rule. Call Mr George Robinson. Oh, thank you very much. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister what impact is the delay having on community planning? Uh, I thank the, the member for his uh, supplementary. Uh, I wrote to the, the councils back in December of, of last year where I gave the commitment uh, by, uh, for my department that we would be fully engaged with the community planning process on which councils have the lead. My department established a community planning steering group with the remit of providing single point of contact for all business areas of my department. Furthermore, my officials also play a full role in the DOE-led uh, interdepartmental community planning group. And I think that the member has, has asked what, for me, is one of the most important elements uh, of the transfer of functions to local councils. As someone who is very proud of the fact that uh, I came into politics uh, in 2001 as a member of Ballymoney Borough Council. And I think that while we have heard a lot about double jobbing and, and we have gone through all that process in this House, uh, I still believe that members who have come to this House from local government uh, have made an invaluable contribution because they bring to the debate, they bring to the issues uh, uh, an importance and an experience which is, uh, I think, only to be had if you have come through local councils. However, I think there's a huge challenge, and I've had a conversation with my colleague, the Minister for the Department of the Environment, as to how we best can ensure that community planning really does work in areas, that it's not just a, a, a policy, it's not just something that we say off the tip of our tongue, but it is something which is real, it is joined up, it is real and meaningful, and when you look at an area, you'll be able to identify a community plan which gives the enhanced services to the local community 
in a way that is, I think, beneficial to the financial position, but more importantly, uh, beneficial to the local community because it's led by them and it's for them. And I think that is a vitally important element of the reform of local government. I call Mr. Alban McGuinness and ask him to be brief. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> Principal Deputy Speaker. I wasn't going to be brief. But uh, this is a, 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 a very exciting opportunity for local councils, and I w wish to, to uh, affirm the minister in his desire to get this right. What about staffing transfers? Will they be in place, and will they be able uh, to exploit the new opportunities that avail of them? Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, Principal Speaker, I will be as brief in my reply. Uh, yes, uh, there will be. Uh, we, we already have done the piece of work in relation to, to the issues of the, implement, the implication for the staff. They will be in place. Uh, and I think that uh, by, if, if the delay has given us any benefit, it is that we, I think we will be in a better position to work with councils so that we have, when this comes into effect, in April 2016, both staff, finance and process in place in a way that is to the benefit of local authorities. Order. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to the period for topical questions, and I call Mr Sean Lynch. Thank you, Deputy Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline what has been done to deal with rural housing uh, on fitness in the Fermanagh area? Uh, I, I thank the member for the question. Uh, and obviously, uh, we have uh, a situation which uh, is, I have to say, beginning to cause me grave concern around the uh, condition of homes in Northern Ireland, particularly uh, in regards to uh, the housing executive. Uh, if I want to achieve anything, in, in my time as a public representative, surely it is about enhancing the lives of people. The people that come to our constituency offices, the people who we represent, the people who we claim that are at the heart of all we do. Uh, I think that one of the issues that has been a huge challenge for me since coming to the department is to see the levels of uh, repair that need to be done. And the member will be aware that uh, the housing executive have appointed Savills to do a, a stock survey and initial findings I think will indicate to us that the state of what is needed or the amount of money that will be needed to give, whether it's in Fermanagh or whether it's in any other part of, uh, the, of Northern Ireland, is going to be a huge challenge, not only for me as Minister, but also for uh, this assembly, because it will create a challenge for us in terms of the uh, amount of money that is going to be needed to address what I believe is a serious problem, uh, despite all the efforts that have been made and despite all the progress that has been made. But I can assure the member that the rural community will not be left out of that analysis and not left out of addressing the need. Mr. Lynch, for a supplementary. And I want to thank the Minister for uh, that answer. And I share the Minister's concerns uh, on the, about the unfitness of housing in rural areas. And I'm also aware that he's not long in his department. But can I ask the Minister to explain what his department will be doing to rectify this issue? Thank you. Well, the member will also be aware that the housing executive carries out an extensive amount of work with rural communities, and, and I have seen some of that work that has uh, been uh, to, uh, out in the communities. In fact, I attended an event uh, in Cookstown not that long ago where uh, it was abundantly clear that the housing executive had a, a grasp and had a handle on how that it had a responsibility, not only as a landlord, but also uh, it had a responsibility in a number of other areas, what, what we become now known as the regional functions that the housing executive have. And uh, while you could have a debate as to whether or not the focus should be on the landlord functions and the focus should be on the uh, other element of their business, I think that the executive have made progress uh, to separate those two functions. And I think that I, along with them, 
uh, will continue to ensure that whether it is in the rural community or whether it's in an urban situation, that uh, the needs of those who are in those properties are addressed in a way that enhances their property. And I believe that when we have in Northern Ireland good quality, affordable housing, then I believe we will give to our community something which is of immense value and profit. Mr. Sean Lynch. So, Mr. John, but Joe Byrne. Sorry, my apologies. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in terms of social housing and in terms of housing stress needs in West Tyrone, what is his department's assessment of crisis housing needs in Strabane and indeed in some parts of home? I don't have uh, the actual figures in relation to, to the need. I'm quite happy to, to supply those to the member. However, I think it, it again it goes back to the point that I made uh, to the previous uh, question or to the previous member. I think there's a huge challenge for, for this House. Uh, and I have said this, and I've said it to uh, members of the DSD committee, I have said it to, to others since coming into post. Uh, we do run the risk that we take our eye of the ball in terms of the importance that we place on housing. Housing has always been, uh, regrettably, in the past seen as a divisive issue, particularly in, in uh, an urban situation. And members are well aware how that I have said in this House in the past that I uh, feel it difficult to come to this House to answer questions when I'm specifically asked how many houses have been built for one particular community or the other. But I do think that if we get the language right, if we get this financial structure right for uh, uh, the housing executive, uh, then there will be a huge opportunity, whether it be in Sturban or Oma or in any other part of Northern Ireland, for us to inject into those communities good quality housing. And I repeat the, 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 the comment because I believe it passionately that if we give to those communities good quality affordable housing, then I think we give to them something which is uh, invaluable. I recently visited uh, even in Belfast here just uh, last week on the Limestone Road uh, in my colleague's constituency. I, what I saw was something which I think is to be admired, something which has been challenging, has, been, has not been fraught without difficulties, but I do believe that the quality of homes that have been provided have given to that community a sense of hope uh, rather than a sense of hopelessness. And I would like to replicate the same in terms of Sturban or Oma. For a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Minister's comments and his views on the situation. Would the Minister accept that in some areas housing stress is created because of people who were homeowners who have had to vacate their homes because they couldn't meet the mortgage, and many of them are now looking for affordable or adequate social housing. And is he able to use his good influence to make sure that housing associations will be able to meet those social housing needs in certain parts of Northern Ireland? I think a member also, and I thank him for his supplementary, and I think again what he, what he highlights is that when we come to look at what is the mix of how we provide housing in Northern Ireland, it won't be down, I believe, to one particular uh, provider. And I think we have, uh, over the last number of years, benefited from ensuring that there is a mix of providers. And I have had conversations with uh, the housing association uh, organisations, the, the number of them that there are. We've had uh, individual conversations with uh, some of them. We've met with the association. And also, as a member will be well aware, I meet on a regular basis uh, the housing executive. And what I want to do in those conversations with the Federation uh, of Housing Association, with the housing executive, with organisations also uh, that would be responsible for co-ownership, uh, and also with the private sector, what we need to do is have as a bottom line for all of those organisations their commitment to ensuring that they will be building properties that are good, quality, affordable homes so that people in Northern Ireland will have that uh, opportunity uh, and that choice, because sometimes they are forced into making 
different choices. And if they are limited in the choices that they can make, then I think we're limited in the outcomes that we will have. But I, will give the, I can give the member an assurance that those ongoing conversations will continue and every effort that I can make to ensure that whether it's the Housing Association, the Housing Executive or, or whatever other elements are uh, in the market in terms of the provision of housing, I, I will continue to work with them and encourage them in the best possible way. Mr. Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what level of support has been provided to uh, volunteering organisations through his department's uh, volunteering small grants fund? Uh, thank the member for, for his, his question. I think that we owe a huge, uh, a huge debt of gratitude to uh, the many uh, volunteers who on a day and daily basis right across Northern Ireland give service to our community and give it in a way which I think is exemplary, give it in a way which uh, contributes to their community. And he has highlighted one particular uh, issue and that is in regards to the uh, volunteering small grants program. And uh, I'm pleased to be able to say that since 2013, uh, we have provided approximately 1.4 million in support through the Volunteering Small Grants Programme. And this programme targets small frontline volunteering organisations who may not normally receive support through other sources. And frontline organisations can receive grants of up to £1,500. And I think for uh, small organisations uh, to receive that amount of money uh, is uh, of huge benefit to them. It can be the means sometimes, unfortunately, of whether or not they continue to do the work that they do. Uh, but be assured, and I have attended since coming into office, uh, a considerable number of events. And whether it's in the sporting field or whether it, it's in other community-led activities, uh, many of them wouldn't be delivered if it wasn't for the actions and the activity and the enthusiasm of our volunteers. Anderson for a supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for that response. And as the Minister quite rightly says, this funding is the lifeline to a lot of our small uh, uh, volunteering organisations. And the amount of money that has already been given to the, the, those organisations. Can I ask the Minister uh, how many organisations have indeed benefited uh, from this support? Uh, thank the member for his supplementary. In 2013-14, in a total of 658 volunteering organisations received support from uh, my department, and in 14-15, support was provided to 660 organisations. And obviously, grants uh, that uh, these organisations apply for can be used to purchase equipment or for training, the running costs of the organisation. And, and I do believe, uh, and I, I repeat it, and I think because it bears repeating, that volunteering is the lifeline of many communities. And I think if you think of Northern Ireland as a small uh, geographical entity uh, compared to the rest of the United Kingdom, however, to have 660 organisations, all that have uh, benefited, all that have been in the receipt of the small grants uh, fund, I think is an indication of how pivotal and how important the voluntary sector is in Northern Ireland. Mr. Atwood is not in his place, and the name at number five was withdrawn within the time frame required. I now call him Mr. Kiernan McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the Department of Work and Pensions uh, across the water is, is closing the ILF, the Independent Living Fund, on the 30th of June. We're just around the corner of this year. The Minister's Department is involved with the Health Minister to take up where the DWP uh, has left off. Can the Minister advise? The families and indeed the House, um, what comes after the 30th of June in order to make sure that severely disabled people are kept in their own house and certainly away from institutional homes? I would like to thank the member for uh, his, his question. You will be aware that this was an issue which was raised uh, during the consideration stage of the Welfare Reform Bill. And, uh, tomorrow, uh, and I have no doubt, I am sure the member will be present. Uh, for the further consideration stage of, of the, the bill when it comes back. I gave an undertaking uh, when the bill was before the House on the previous occasion that this issue would be raised 
with the Health Minister. I have done that. I have had a, a brief conversation uh, in relation to the issue. As you can imagine, over the last couple of weeks, the Health Minister has unfortunately had to deal uh, with uh, the situation that still pertains, sadly, to do with the health of, of his wife. Uh, but uh, I will hopefully have more to say about that issue tomorrow when we come to the House in relation to the uh, further consideration stage of the Welfare Bill. Time for a very brief supplementary, Mr McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister uh, obviously knows how important, indeed vital, it is uh, that come the 30th of June these people will have some. In fact, now is the time that people want to know what the future holds for the people that are at home. They do not want to be going into or looking for homes. Now is the time. It's absolutely vital for to uh, you know re respond positively to the consultation, which is up, as you know, positively. I, and I, I can assure the member that I am equally concerned that uh, we don't find ourselves in some sort of no man's land in relation to this, that there is clarity, that there is a clear understanding as to what is going to take place. And given the consultation that there was, given the concerns that were expressed, and given the importance that the fund uh, has in terms of how it uh, is administered and how it's delivered to the benefit of people uh, in their homes and in the community, uh, those issues are not lost on me, and I don't believe either will they be lost on the Health Minister. But I, I reaffirm what I said earlier, that I trust that I'll be in a position to say something more of detail in relation to that issue tomorrow uh, during the debate. Order. Time is up. That concludes question time. I invite